evening to those of you joining us online and everyone in the room. I'm Nairi Woods and welcome to the Blavatnik School of Government. Tonight, with great pleasure, we're going to hear from Frank Luntz on saving democracy, a strategy for better government. Frank is renowned for his work as a pollster, his use of focus groups, considered by people on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States as a particularly adept reader of what America thinks, as it were. He did his doctorate here at Oxford at Trinity College just a couple of years ago and published it as a book entitled Candidates, Consultants and Campaigns, a good direction finder for where Frank has gone subsequently. Frank, a very warm welcome back to the school. I know Frank loves his lectures to be interactive, so I think he would want me to encourage you to put questions to him. Those of you who are online, please do submit your questions. Just use the little Q&A button. I'm sitting here at the side. You won't see me, but I have an iPad. And as your questions arrive, I will throw them into the interactive session we're about to have. So please do feel free to ask questions, even if you're not in the room. Those of you in the room, just wave your hand and Frank will, will, will call on you as and when. Thanks all for joining us. Frank, over to you and a big welcome back to the Black School of Government. I never thought I'd be playing traffic cop as people come in, but you guys can help me. So even though she's coming in just a bit late, we got seats right here in the front row. <laughs> so here's the good news. The front row is now the back row for a few minutes. So this is the perfect time. We got two chairs there for the two of you right there. We got chairs dead center. The best seats have been saved for you. Uh, either there in the front here. Um, the purpose of this conversation is to look at democracy. And what I'm gonna be showing you is actually very difficult. It's never been shown before. These are the outtakes of focus groups that were so bad that we were not able to air it. It was considered too angry, too hostile. And you guys in the corner, we got chairs up here. You can move, my, throw my jacket over. I certainly do. You can sit in that chair there. You have a chair right here in the center. The way I want to begin is I'm going to start in this back row here because you thought you were safe, but you're not. I want to work all the way down this back row. I'm going to have you guys look at the worst side of me, my back part. And when I say democracy, I want you to give me one word or phrase and tell me what country you're from. And let's go all the way around in this back row, a word or phrase to describe democracy as well as what country you're from. Um, I'm from Italy, and I would say the word which comes to mind is deliberation. 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 Brazil, endangered. Uh, Ecuador, the only way forward. By the way, I was supposed to come, I didn't know this because I, I know who you were, but I was supposed to come. You, ha you had a leader who had been there and I, he, he's now been replaced. And I was supposed to come down and actually interview people about his leadership. He had a favorability rating of negative. He was extremely unpopular. And I never made it down there because of COVID. So this is as close as I will get. <laughs> Democracy. Uh, hope. And what? Uh, UK. Freedom. And what country? Uh, I'm originally from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm from Colombia, I would say rule of law. Canada, participation. France, equity. UK, accountability. Uh, Brazil, I think you're as well. India, chaotic. <laughs> wow, someone who doesn't need a microphone. <laughs> It's like, I'll sit there. <laughs> this is so great. Um, Spain community. Okay, I'm heading to Spain in a week, so don't be running off because I need help. Mexico, challenged. Argentina, the will of the people. Um, Chinese Canadian, privilege. Uh, US and Germany, rights. I got to ask you a question, a vote from everybody here. Is democracy mostly working or is it mostly struggling right now? 
Think of think of, of various countries, think of your country and other countries, democracies that basically working. And look, I'm moving my coat. So one of you two come on up. I hate, I hate people. Okay, this is a democracy. We're gonna vote on which person should have to come up. Seat. And then that someone said it. Yes, we got a chair right there too. So come on, guys, get off the floor. This is 2022. You no longer have to be seated on the floor. You get to have a chair. We got a chair right there. We have a chair back there. We got a chair up here. Come on. We have a chair. We have two chairs right there. You're okay. No, you're okay. You're okay. Oh, I get it. I get it. Yes, that's a good idea. I can't lift it. You got another chair here. By the way, I do this all the time. So this is not out of the ordinary. I hate people having this on the floor. Uh, we've got two chairs right here. Great. This is perfect. Okay. Show of hands. Is democracy mostly working or is it mostly struggling? I raise your hands. Who says it's mostly working? Who says it's mostly struggling? I agree with you guys. Why is it mostly struggling? Well, at least back home in Indonesia, it's 38 parties. There's never been a real left or right. Right now, it's politics of interest. Democracy is used as a tool of the oligarchs for to further their interests. So I don't feel like the real participation from people is there. Why is it mostly struggling? I don't answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> I might accidentally give a lecture, so I <laughs> Well, fortunately, I'm more cooperative than that. Someone here, why is it mostly struggling? Anybody? It's been... Incompetent, ineffective, and not serving what it was designed and meant to do. Are you Boris Johnson's mom? <laughs> I hate words. <laughs> no shit. By the way, what's the definition, the new definition of chaos? Father's Day at 10 Downing Street. <laughs> Why is it struggling? Uh, it's produced a lot of division. Why is democracy working? A few of you did raise your hands. Why do you think it depends on how you define it? How, you, how do you define it? So it's not a matter of how I define it, but I'm saying that you can't answer the question that you have posed without knowing what you say democracy is. You must be a professor here. <laughs> I, I, I choose not to define. I am so humble that I can't offer a definition. And we had people who reacted to it. Why, for those of you who raised your hands that it's working, mostly, why do you think so? Because you saw more hands go up. Why should we feel better about democracy? By the way, we're all participating here. Yes, sir. Because the opposite is unimaginable. I, I, okay. And I will jump in on some of this. I thought so too. And I realized that I have to apologize to those who in 2015 and 2016 told me what the threat was. And I thought they were being ridiculous. I thought they were being hyperbolic. And I turned out to be wrong. And I didn't realize I was wrong until January 6, 2021. But my God, did I realize I was wrong. One more person to defend democracy. Governing parties are losing and handing over to uh, the, the winners. Even in your country. <laughs> and that's not your country. <laughs> okay, just for the record, I do the jokes here. So, <laughs> so I'm going to show you how bad it gets. None of this stuff is aired. There are eight focus groups that are on this. I'm just going to run, let it run for about three minutes. And I was debating because I know not to be pessimistic, but I am. And I know not to be negative, but I am. And this is the reason why. And I'll stop it for a few minutes. Now, these are sessions where there are four or five cameras. They know they're going to be on TV. They know their kids are watching. They know their neighbors are watching. And it took five minutes in each case for this to, to, to degenerate into a brawl.
It took four minutes for this to degenerate and it just came apart. Is this America? No. Yes. 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 How many of you think this is America? And you know why? Because so both sides. What's wrong? It's happening right now. It's happening right now. I don't think that emotions. How about we have like adults that take turns instead of really speaking over each other? So I think. Why not like nobody's going? So that's Orlando. That's the home of Disney. That's the home of joy and happiness and the magic kingdom. And that yelling and screaming was typical. This is now Cleveland, Indiana. Cleveland, Indiana, geez. Uh, Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> and as I say to people from Detroit, at least be thankful you're not from Cleveland. This is how Cleveland reacts. We don't they need want them, them they dead, did, period. They it doesn't did, matter you know where our embassy is. I feel is. like they Donald Trump didn't do it for them. that reason. He doesn't you, like you know what? In, in parts part of Israel, Israel they have like playgrounds in the schools, like underground, he because like of Hamas rocket He did that to start the attack. So they can kill each other. And you think an embassy? Donald Trump did nothing to do that. No, the embassy is a symbology. How do you make peace with somebody who wants to kill the real? We want to kill the real. By the way, I never had Santa Claus participate in the photo <laughs> school. I was so excited to meet him. I mean, all they want to do is kill you. The reality is that's what I'm not. They always want to do is kill you. And wipe Israel off the face of the earth. You can't make the reality. Like, who are you? You're a Jew. This is not America. Yes. Well, it's not America. 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 It's Here we go. Problem. No, it's not. Right, no, right there. Your attitude is the problem. My attitude? Yes. I don't want somebody telling me that my schools have to have prayer, the schools have to have prayer in school. I didn't say that. They did not before. I said, always be prayer in school. Why? I said that God chooses the color of our skin. That's all I said. Now, if if you don't say, what that, if you don't believe who's making the choice? What if you, if you don't believe in God? Don't believe in God. Make the choice. Make the choice. And we don't care. Care. Yes, you do, because you try and force it on everybody else. No. So, you're, you're you're making a lot of gross assumptions. I'm not making you're gross assumptions. You I'm are looking making gross assumptions. assumptions. I'm looking at Mike Pence, who signed anti LGBT in Indiana. So what? I rest my case. It all comes down to listening to what the other person has to say. Open up your ears and not your mouth, and listen to what other people have to say, then weigh what's going on. What They're all think? liars. They what all lie. Okay, then what do you think? Everybody says about Trump United being States. aggressive and, and brutal and, and all this stuff. But you saw God in sending was Obama. But you, I couldn't stand to watch that guy. He just looked down on top of everybody. Trump will get down in the dirt and work with you. Yeah, so Obama you, you would never respect. respect. That. You want respect, but you have a president who takes on women, Minorities, everything but white you know, males. He won the election. And he, he won. He didn't and you guys can't vote. handle that. He didn't have the popular problem. vote. Check you can't it. handle it. Did he get the popular vote? It doesn't make any difference. All different causes put in place different. for that simple reason. He won. This is America. And this is the America that is actually happening. This is not what America was back seven years ago. I've been doing this now on TV since 2000, and it's become absolutely impossible to have a conversation anymore. Yes, sir. What's the purpose of the, those meetings? What are you asking those people? Uh, I'm asking them questions about the economy. I'm asking them questions about politics. I'm asking them questions about leadership. Uh, sometimes it's a social issue, so each one is different. The one in Ohio, was about the economy. The one that you saw from Cleveland 
was about foreign policy. The one you just saw there was retirement issues. Everyone who was yelling there is at least 65 years old. So you would think that our grandparents behave properly. That's our grandparent. Well, in my case, that's now my generation. <laughs> I just realized that, oh my God, you just, I just got depressed. Oh, um, and that's how they treat each other. And there's one here that's about race. And I'm not gonna show you it because you get the point. I've got one with young people tearing each other apart. It takes five minutes of a political conversation among average people, not this room, but among average people for things to come apart. And that's the problem. So when did that change, Frank? So I believe, and, and I'm gonna get into whatever trouble I'm gonna get into. I'm just gonna, you're gonna tell me what, you should take notes and tell me where I'm dead wrong and where I'm right. Donald Trump reflected America and he caused America at the same time. It was a, uh, a confirmation. It existed before Trump. Trump spoke to it, caused it to speak up more. Trump spoke to that, caused it to speak up more. And it was this relationship. And it's not just on the right, it's also on the left. And you have the, pro and I can name the same kind of politicians that do it there as well. But Trump is the biggest force. And it is not just happening in America, it's happening across the globe. And the, the main agitator of it is social media. Because social media amplifies, uh, amplifies the negative and we lose so much of the positive. And the issue is if we're not willing to tackle it and acknowledge it and challenge it, then it will overwhelm us. To me, it reminds me of an ocean coming in with a horrible undertow that's pulling us in and we see it and we know it and we feel it and we participate in it. I don't believe you would have spoken about Boris as intensely as you did 10 years ago. But now our system actually encourages us to do so. We wouldn't have had a Boris ten years ago. Okay, I don't know how to respond. So I went. By the way, I went to school with him. I went to university with him. He was at Balliol. I was at Trinity. I'd like to say that Trinity folk don't behave the way that Balliol folk do, but I don't know whether that joke works in this room or not. Um, we interviewed a thousand women last year and we asked them, would you have relations with Boris Johnson if you could? 21% said, never again. <laughs> oh, come on, that's my best joke. <laughs> You're like trying not to laugh, come on, Jesus. Um, and so that's the situation that we're in and I wanna show you numbers behind this. Uh, any other questions before I do that? Yes, sir. You attempt to, well, you, you're at the front, right there. Say again? You were at the front during these discussions. Yes. Did you attempt to chair them at all? Yes. Uh, and, you, and when you did intervene at one stage, it seemed to go quiet. It did not go quiet. It erupted. It just erupts, 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 and I can stop it, and it takes two minutes for it to start up again. Yeah, I can say to people, shut up. Uh, something that, no one, that you all don't know, I was invited to do this for 60 minutes. Uh, four days before the elections of 2016. It was my, the height of my, prof of my profession. It's the most watched show in the United States. They put my focus group on for 17 minutes. And what no one knows is I walked out in the group. I actually left and I have the vi video, but you don't need to see it now. And I said, I can't do this. I went to the executive producer. I said, bring the talent on. Uh, Steve Croft was the one who was the, the host of my segment. And my executive producer says, he swears at me, what the F is your problem? Get in there, do your job. If they're so nuts, we'll pick it up. Go, to, you're not, we put $50,000 into this taping, get your ass in there. I quit on live, not on live television, but on the most important show of my life because I could not stop them. And you see it on TV, and this is the edited stuff that never made it on. We're a shit show right now. And there's not much that's going on that's particularly healthy in any country. Yes, sir. I know a lot of people would look to America as being perhaps the byproduct of democracy or attribute America's current state to mm -hmm. democracy. And some may even 
relate democracy to America, but to what extent does viewing a video like that confound the problems with democracy and problems that exist in America, which may exist independently of democracy? Uh, and they probably do exist independently, but it is now all one challenge. And because America is the place that people look at, I want you to see it. I want you to see my life. I want you to see what's actually happening, not the edited version, but the unedited version. Because the whole conversation today is where does democracy stand? So some, is anyone here from France? or since I'm in the UK, France. <laughs> uh, so you tell me, Le Pen got 42% of the vote. I've had two different comments back to me. She lost, she got 42%, democracy's working. And I also got, oh my God, she actually got 42%. Which side are you on? She lost. So we're all okay there. No, but like institutions are here to not let this happen. In, in, the, in the French case where there's no proportional, right? But you're right, I do agree. It's a huge sign of alarm that she's got 42% of the population, but she finally lost. Okay, so you're, you're glass half full, glass half empty. Uh, that's perfect. Uh, I look at, at parties across the globe that I never thought this was possible. Where's my Venezuela? Uh, where are you? Right there. I worked in his election. I worked in the last free election. It can disappear. I didn't know that when Chavez got elected, he was going to stay for life and his number two would then stay for life. I assume that there continue to be elections there. I know we got students here from Colombia, from Peru. I'm nervous about their democracies. We assume that it's just going to continue. And I'm not willing to assume that anymore. And again, my challenge to you all is how we collect our information, how that information is disseminated, because I am nervous about social media. I am nervous that we're learning things that simply aren't true. A democracy depends on a little bit of distance. If we are directly involved in that process, and this is something I did not believe. So I used to be a populist, and I'm not anymore. I believe that the public's will was the best. I don't care what they voted for and that they should be heard and they should be front and center. And I don't feel that way anymore. I actually believe in representative government because direct democracy makes a mess of things. All the initiatives in California, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what we're voting on. You vote one way two years, then we vote a different way two years from now. That's no way to run a government. And so, I'm nervous about that. I'm nervous about the instantaneousness of social media, that there's no time for thinking. There's no time for perspective. I'm nervous about the anonymity of social media, that you can say anything you want because you're never held accountable. And I'm nervous that it emphasizes the negativity. Right, a question from Todd Pitcher, who's online. To what extent do you feel accountable for playing an active role in debasing the conversation in America? You advised Republicans to talk like mute by describing. No, Democrats. that's. I'm going to cut you. Hold on. I'm going to cut you off because that I'm going to respond. That is not my memo, and that is the promise of social media. I did not get to know that memo was written in 1990. I did not even get to know Newton until 1993. The memo was written three years earlier than me, and according to social media, this guy Tom just repeats what he read online. This is my pro I, but Frank, to be fair, I didn't do you that. You had your moment of you had your kind of Damascene moment, right? I mean, you 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 were part of a very partisan politics and partisan framing of conversation. I think what's really interesting for this room is to hear what changed your mind, what made you believe that actually you needed to play a different role in this debate. Then uh, twenty two things. Number one is I started to come to this because my opinion on climate is the best example. I was involved in changing global warming to climate change back in, and this is now 21 years ago. This isn't based on today's science. This was based on what I saw and what I read more than two decades ago. And I had changed by 20, 2009. So 13 years ago, I had my come to Jesus moment. But you wouldn't know that from the media. You wouldn't know that from social media. 
because they still report on a memo that I wrote 20 years ago, but at least I actually wrote that memo. I did not write the memo that Tom was speaking of. And the guy who wrote that, since I know this is going out, is Joe Gaylord. If you don't have, if you have an issue with anyone, you know who he is, go call Joe Gaylord, because I hate that guy, because he wrote that shit that I get blamed for. So the guy's name is Joe Gaylord, Joseph Gaylord. You can, I'll, I'll, I'm going to find his phone number and give you his cell number so you can all call him at the same time. And everyone with a different accent can yell at him from all the different countries you're from. And uh, that would be the worst of the worst. <laughs> what would be? Everybody yelling at him on the phone. Well, that would be, for one brief moment, that would be a good thing. <laughs> I give you permission to yell in that situation. And you can see I get agitated over it because it really does bother me. Um, so 2009, I switched on climate. No one talks about that. I worked for the Environmental Defense Fund in 2009. Took a while to make to get a, a, a connection to make things work, uh, but it was really 2015. And it was, it was the Trump campaign. And it was very difficult for me. It was very much a challenge for me because his language was not my language. His approach was not my approach. I prefer to out positive the people that I work for. And I stopped doing campaigns 19 years ago. I haven't done a campaign since then. I sit down and I help people on policy, but not in running for office. It's one of the reasons why when we had this discussion today, I want to know what words matter to you. I want to know what policies matter to you. And I don't want to be part of, of all that negativity. I, haven't, I have a real issue with that. And when I would come in and do briefings, and I still did for this last White House, it was always in a, it, to present a positive look at the things that we would agree on, as opposed to how to demonize your opponent. And I will acknowledge that I'm not as good because of that. The negative outdoes the positive. They would probably like to know how to win. And I think, and you can challenge me, I think it's easier to win if it's negative. I don't want to do that anymore. That's not what I'm wired to do. So 2015, we had a very, very tough campaign, Trump and the other candidates. And then I had a second uh, moment when on January 10th of 2020, I had a stroke while I was up in New Hampshire. And that has completely rewired me uh, emotionally, uh, physically. And that too has played a major role. But I was teaching before then. This had been happening before that effort. And it's why I try to show those things that up to now I had not talked about. And I'll answer any question that you have. I just want, I don't want to further the misinterpretation or, or things that simply are not true. So the single, yeah, go ahead. Um, you said that... Uh... The situation already existed. The defense has already existed in America and Trump sort of just riled it up. When you put it that way, the situation seems extremely hopeless because then there is very, it feels like there is very little you can do to sort of combat polarization. And I'm drawing parallels to India where something similar is happening in a different context. But I personally feel that it's the leaders that like in India's case, at least like that, that, that hatred has been filled more Maybe there was some sort of resentment that was happening, but I, I probably think like it just doesn't exist in vacuum. I feel like there are people who come, people who are leaders who are charismatic and leaders who are populist, and they they sort of rally and sway people. And that's the reason why it happens, because they're promised something that is not delivered. In the end, they're made promises that people cannot keep. And so when your expectations get that high and the reality is that low, that's what creates the environment where leaders can approach people and, and make things much darker and much more difficult. And this is when democracies have a problem, because in the end, democracies, there's a line from the New York Times or, or, or Washington Post, democracies die in darkness. Democracies also die when you're not dealing with the facts, when you're not dealing with truth. We have to know. We can disagree over the cause. We can disagree over the solution. But we have to agree on the truth for us to move forward as a society. And that's my greatest fear, that we are undermining the truth right now. For example, the, the big lie, that Trump even uses language from the 1940s, the big lie. 
that uh, he actually won, that the, he was denied the election, the election was stolen. Does anyone in this room believe the election was stolen? Does anyone in this room believe that Donald Trump won the election? And yet this guy was president of the United States. And there was a point when 72% of his own vote, as we pulled it just before he left office, 72% of Trump voters at one point thought he won the election. That's the death of democracy. It's now down to about 40% and it falls every month. But those who believe it, absolutely believe it. And how are you supposed to talk to them when they don't even believe that, the, that Joe Biden was a legitimately elected president? That's my fear. And this is the cause. When you make promises that you can't keep, we have a real problem. And I want you, I'm going to go back and forth between American data, UK data. We could talk about this globally as well. This is another problem, which is, are you better off than your parents were? So let's do a vote here. How many of you believe that at this point in your parents' life, your quality of life is better than your parents? Raise your hands. Almost everybody. Now tell me the truth. How many of you believe either your children or the next generation, if you don't have kids? How many of you believe, not want, but believe your kids will be better off than you are, or the next generation will be better off? Raise your hands. Look at this. Look at this. Don't look at me. Please look at them. This is the problem. And this has been happening over the last 10 years. Some of it is climate. Some of it is, is because of race. Some of it is because of injustice. Some of it is because of fairness. Some of this is because of the economy. But whatever it is, you now understand. You're now participants in why people feel so agitated, so angry, so frustrated. If you can't deliver for your children a better life, then you're pretty upset with the system, with the economic system and with the political system. And you all are well off, maybe not economically, but intellectually. This is a very intelligent room. And if you feel that way, imagine those that don't have the opportunities that you have. Imagine how they feel. I'll stop for another. Yes. I have a 15-year-old grandson who's very bright. And it's relevant to say that he and all his friends don't believe in their own future. They feel very despairing, very bitter, and very cynical. And here's part of that. And by the way, that's how, the, and we, we forget about them in America. If I can do this the- This is in the UK. I live here. And if Despite I- the accent. <laughs> where's that, by the way, where's that accent from? 50 years ago, the stage, but I've been here for 50 years. I just can't learn. <laughs> when I got, I, I, I will tell you a very quick story. Um, I got my D fill in my first shot and I really did not, did not like this place that much at all. And I got, and they told me I got my degree and I wanted to tell my parents in person. I didn't want to tell them on the phone. <laughs> So I said, I need to fly home. I got to talk to you. And they think that I haven't gotten my degree. And I get home. And the first thing my mother says is, why don't you speak British? I'm like, what do you want from me? She says, you've been over there for three years now and you don't have a British accent. You're stupid. <laughs> it, by the way, this is exactly what she said. And it was not funny. I was really angry. And I had my degree. I'm about to tell her that her... Blessed child got a DPhil from Oxford, but I was so mad at her for calling me stupid that I didn't want to tell her. <laughs> so I said, can we please go look at cars? And my mom turns around and yelling at me still. I said to you, you're not getting a car until you get your degree from Oxford. I want my son to have a DPhil. I want to call my son doctor. You're not getting a car. I said, I know, mom. Let's go look at cars. She's in mid yell, so she doesn't hear what I just said to her. And my dad hears, looks, I see his eyes open like this. He reaches over, to, you know, like a dad to like, to like grab me and, and, and say, this is wonderful. The problem is his other hand is on the steering wheel and he pulls it over as he's, well, and, and, <laughs> and basically does just that with a car and the car almost <laughs> drives off the road. So I have to say, mom, let's go look at cars. And she was so happy 
but she was so mad that I didn't listen more carefully to pick up the accent. So I know exactly how you feel. Uh, here's a, Should I feed you some of the questions coming in? Yes, I'm gonna ask you a favor. I know this is supposed to end at six. Can you let me go to 6.15? I'm going to supply a lot of information for you guys. I think there's a sort of sense of yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm both at eight to leave at six, totally understood. Dorkina Myrick, who is uh, an alumna of the Labatnik School, writes, what are your thoughts on Elon Musk extending a welcome to Donald Trump <laughs> to return to Twitter? If Trump accepts the invitation, what are the consequences for politics? And how much impact has Trump had with Truth Social? Okay, so if you're from away, if you're away from here, you only get one question rather than three because I want to give you guys the benefit. Uh, the 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 Trump's foray into social media has failed miserably. Nobody's following him. He's not relevant. So the decision of Elon Musk is a very big deal. How many of you, if you were in charge of Twitter, would invite Trump back? Raise your hands. Okay, by the way, please look up because I want you to see your audience here. <laughs> Nobody. And I'm gonna ask you one more time, thinking about freedom of speech. And even if you dislike him, even if you hate him, shouldn't he have access to the platform like every other human being across the globe? Now, how many of you would invite Donald Trump back to Twitter? Raise your hands. Okay, a few more hands go up, but still only a few. So you're not gonna let him back. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> By the way, he's not watching right now, I assure you. <laughs> this is much too intellectual for him. And I do want to make a point that Boris Johnson has actually written more books than Donald Trump has read. <laughs> what is this with you all? I get paid a ton of money for this. Uh, why won't you let Trump back? Um, I think the net effect would be too divisive. So, so I think it's, it's fair to, to not have him that um, have but give him that platform. Who disagrees with that? Surely the, 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 the point is something about what, what he says. And if, if what he says is demonstra demonstrably untrue and false, then surely the, there needs to be some control over that. Um, I'm not sure about a blanket ban, but... Go ahead. Uh, I would suggest that Twitter is a core utility for constructing a future democracy that actually works. We need like big platforms which actually reach a lot of people and they that they operate in the way that at and is to it and let's say 1960 or something. So when you cut these people off, where do they go? It doesn't go away. They still try to find outlets for their expression and cutting them out just seems like a very bad idea, I think. Thank you, Elon. <laughs> yes. I was going to say the notion of free speech is never actually free. In Germany and both in the UK, there are safeguards, we have parameters, legally and otherwise. So when people tell, oh, it's free speech, we should allow people to say what they like, we've never had free speech, total free speech. So I think we shouldn't, you know, we need to make those sorts of distinction. In Germany, there are very strong laws against anti-Semitic remarks, so do we, we have that in the UK. So I, I think, you know, this thing about social media, we do need safeguards in there to protect free speech, it goes the other way. This is a perfect place for me to have this debate in another forum. Last comment. Yeah, freedom of speech is not the, it's, it's one value, but it's not the only value that we need to protect. And some of these values have trade-offs. So um, some things are destructive to democracy, some things are actually weak speech. And we have to find some balance where there are guidelines as to how you behave in public space, such as Twitter. The problem then becomes who makes that decision. Yeah, and that probably shouldn't be Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow, yeah. A lot of Americans feel the same, but a lot of them don't. Elon Musk has become like the Thomas Edison. Well, clearly not for this side of the room, <laughs> but uh, he's a significant person right now. I want to show you how the challenge for partisanship the United Kingdom is an institutionally racist and discriminatory uh, nation. A narrow majority of labor voters agree with that. By four to one, conservative voters disagree with that. Overall, it's two to one against, but you've got half of labor that agrees with that. 
part of the problem is our, our basic points of view, no matter what country you're in, that there is this divide that's happening and we don't see any similarity that it's not just polarization for the sake of polarization. It's also polarization because we simply don't agree on the basic tenets. Another example, which is from America. Do you think of yourself invest in America's future? Two thirds say yes. And this to me is the most important element of America. And of all the things I can show you, this is the most important. Only 31% think America's invested in their future. This is a disaster. When you love something and invest in something and support something and emotionally are in it, and that thing isn't supporting you, that's not simply disagreement. That gets to this ugliness that we have gotten right now in resentment. I'm going to show you what's awful. 72% of Americans say they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore. That's pretty rough. Go ahead. So if you're saying that we're, you know, effectively polarized as opposed to ideologically polarized at this point, how do you fix it? How do you, you can't put it back in the box. I mean, if you were a populist, how do you unstrategize out of this now? And, and I'm not a populist anymore, but how do I unstrategize is to look for someone with a bigger heart, is to look for someone who is not Donald Trump and who is not Joe Biden and is not uh, Kamala Harris either. On the Democratic side, and you're American, so you'll know some of these people. I think you are. Uh, if, if you were Canadian, you would throw your water at me right now. Um, Mitch Landrieu, he's the former mayor of New Orleans. He is the former lieutenant governor of Louisiana. He is running the president's infrastructure plan. This guy has a heart bigger than, the, bigger than this room. He is the best retail politician. I'm going to give you five names for you to look up. And these are, this is going to be your homework assignment for all of you, because these are very special people. Landrew, I've never seen a better retail politician than him. Second is Cory Booker. He ran for president. He did not run a good campaign. I don't think he was, his, his, was effective at all. The old Cory Booker, when he was mayor of New Jersey, when he was first elected, the U.S. Senate was incredible, focused on education, focused on reform and not partisan. And he's senator from uh, New Jersey. And third is Michael Bennett, the senator from Colorado. He's not particularly exciting. Once again, he is absolutely committed to doing the right thing rather than the partisan thing. So even though he was chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, when Barack Obama was president, several times he voted against the Obama administration. That's guts. On the Republican side, the senator from South Carolina, Tim Scott, African-American, probably the top African-American in the Republican Party, gave the State of the Union response to, to Joe Biden. The guy just doesn't like negative. He doesn't do it because of his faith and because of his belief that we have to do a positive approach to what's going on. Ben Sass, the senator from Nebraska, the um, probably the smartest member of the U.S. Senate, uh, a vocal opponent of Trump. I believe he voted for Trump's impeachment, which might make it impossible for him. But this is someone who puts family ahead of policy. And then the sixth person is an independent. And I'll be curious, how many of you know who Joe Manchin is? Raise your hands. <laughs> Who does not know who Joe Manchin is? So he's a Democratic senator. He's the 50th Democratic senator, and he's holding up everything, a lot of things that Joe Biden is trying to do. And actually, the more successful he is because of what he's doing, just maybe the more that he's helping the Democratic Party because he's preventing them from voting for tax increases. He's preventing them from voting for even more spending in this inflationary time that we live in. He's the sixth person I would tell you to look at because he puts country over party. He's not a Republican. He's not loyal to the, to the Biden agenda. He's his own man. He's a Democratic senator from the most Republican state in the country, and he still gets elected, West Virginia. So those are the six people I would tell you to take a look at. Am I missing anybody? Good. Good list. Uh, questions or comments? Go ahead, sir. 
And by the way, my, hold on one second. My students here, I want to hear from you. I want you to participate. I appreciate the other people who are in this room, but you're my students or you are these, you're not my students, you're her students, but you're these students. So come on, engage me. Yes, sir. What I don't understand about America is when Trump uh, encouraged all those people to walk on the cap to invade the Capitol. And then there was a lot of, lot of fuss that uh, democracy was in peril and it was all very dangerous. I mean, to me, just look, I, what I don't understand is it was they were just a disorganized rabble. But people seem to have taken them very seriously, which was exacerbated by the fact that the people doing the security were absolutely useless and they got further. And the other thing is Trump said he was going to go with them. He was nowhere near them. But they, they just went on. They were rather sad, hopeless people, I thought. But I, I couldn't see that they were the threat to democracy that people have made a huge hoo-ha about. Well, it was to look at it one way, to see a gentleman who had gone into the Capitol wearing a loincloth and carrying a stick and looking like Thor from a cartoon book was a little weird. But we never had that before. We never had people break into an establishment like that, break windows, force their way in, basically try to injure, if not permanently, security, try to get into the House, get into the Senate, carrying with them weapons that had no business in the US Capitol, carrying with them wire to tie people up. That does not seem like an innocent, peaceful demonstration. I know that it's easier on many of the people that I support if I downplay it, but I can't because I know how awful it looked to the world. I know how embarrassed I was when it happened. I know the damage they did to the Capitol, which was extensive. I know that they had no business in that building and maybe the, the security people weren't tough enough. But when you took a look at the footage that has come out since that day and how horrible it is and how aggressive those people were and how they were trying to hurt, maim, maybe even kill. And that woman who was told to the one who got killed, who was trying to break her way into the floor of the house with members there, you do not do this. And that is not a healthy democracy when people like that do that. And there are hundreds of people in the Capitol. This is not the way democracy is supposed to work. And I wish I felt differently. Yes, sir. Um, so out of, the, out of the names that you mentioned, perhaps maybe Cory Booker, but the other ones, it's really hard to, to imagine a path for them at a national level in the United States to become president or, or, or get to a national level. So how do you reconcile this idea of, as a politician, you have to be representative of, of your base, of your electorate, and clearly the electorate seems to be very polarized. So the, how do you reconcile that with this bigger belief of democracy and wanting to fight polarization in general? Because I think that you want to make a statement even though I said to you, I want you to make a difference, not a statement, running in itself makes a statement. If you put someone on stage who says, I will not attack, and they're on every single debate stage, and I will not be negative, and I will not tear my, you can say whatever you want about me, I will not do it about you. That sends a message to everybody watching that that is a legitimate point of view. Sometimes you run as Eugene McCarthy did in 1968. He never expected to beat the president. He ran against the war and it had an impact. When Ronald Reagan ran in 1976, he was not supposed to win because we had an incumbent Republican president. Reagan did not win in 76, but he won in 1980. He was making a statement, an ideological statement. We've had candidate Gary Hart in 1984 was not supposed to win. But Gary Hart said, we need new ideas. We need a new vision. Gary Hart in 1984 led the way for Bill Clinton in 1992. So sometimes you run like that. Ross Perot in 1992 led the way for a lot of Republicans to move into the Democratic Party. John Anderson led the, uh, did the same thing in, in uh, 1980. You don't always run to, to win. Sometimes you run to make a difference. And I hope that these people do. Yes, sir. Uh, Lawrence from, from South Africa. 
my view is that the multi-party politics by its nature uh, assumes that uh, there are some level of differences in society. Otherwise, uh, I think we'll get to that point where centralist politics is the only politics that we need. And I think that would be unfortunate because we need people who come with uh, programs for fundamental uh, uh, transformation. So where do you draw the distinction between differences that should exist in society, ideological differences, and what we call polarization? Because I'm worried that we may get to that point where, you know, presenting uh, aggressive disagreements is seen as polarization. And I don't think that's, that's how it should be seen. I think your country did it. And by the way, good, there are three countries, I think, about this now. South Africa, and what it did in Truth and Reconciliation, and the Good Friday Agreement in Belfast, and the Tripartite Agreement in Lebanon. And here's the problem. I've been to Belfast, and that agreement affects the surface of society. It does not reflect reconciliation. It does not reflect hatred. It does reflect a desire for peace. South Africa, it is not for me to comment on your government, but what has happened there over the last few years is not what was happening in the first 10 years post-apartheid, and it is a shame. Lebanon, the effort to find some sort of arrangement for the three religions was a great effort, and it has not resulted in a great economy or a great political system. You are absolutely correct. There has to be room, but the question is, does, the, does democracy function? Does the government do the will of the people? There are certain governments, we got someone here from Singapore, somebody here from the Emirates. These are governments that are by no means democracies at all. And yet the governments do function, some better than others. Some rights are maintained, other ones, they, they need help. The question is whether we can actually get things done. Can this government address inflation? This one right here, this UK government. We know what's happening with fuel prices. We know what's happening with food prices. The same thing in the States. I'm not convinced that these governments can address those challenges. Can they address the issues of race? Can they address the issues of gender inequality? Can they address those controversies? It's not whether it's left or right. It's not whether it's young or old. It's not whether it's extreme or centrist. Can we talk to each other? And that's my issue. We are losing the ability to talk to each other. Yes. Right. So it's nearly six o'clock. Six o'clock. A strategy for better government. Can you start giving us some hope? What would what would the planks of your strategy be for better government? Okay, I'm going to answer that question, but he's going to leave. So I'm just, I'm just putting my laptop away. <laughs> I'm watching every minute. <laughs> Uh, the first is the people themselves, which is you have to have people who actually want to talk, want to listen, want to work together, want to find solutions. I don't think we had that in America between 1917 and 19, between 2017 and 2021. Do you want to reach out, bring people in and work together? Now, there is an exception to that, which is social, which is justice reform that the administration really did want to accomplish something and they were working across the aisle and did an excellent job. Is there more to be done? Sure. But they actually got something done. Do you want to work together? Bill Clinton wanted to work with the Republicans in the House and Senate. Absolutely. Tony Blair was a centrist in this country, not for being a centrist, but for getting things done. So we do have success stories, but they, they depend on the will of the people to want to make that happen. Number two is that we need to open the political systems so that you don't just have people on the right choosing people on the right and people on the left choosing people on the left. I actually believe in open primaries. Now, right now, my political career, if this is being broadcast uh, on YouTube, I'm just blowing myself up. So I will have no place. You're going to have to hire me because I'm going to have no place to go. <laughs> But if you close and only people from your party choose people from the party to represent the country, you automatically lose the people in the center. You automatically lose that glue that allows us to work together. So open primaries would help. 
Uh, number three is I'm starting to study the idea of ranked choice voting. Because right now you can win with 35% of the vote if you're running against five or six other people and that's not representative of the country. I'm studying it because I think I need to figure out whether that does open things or not. Number four is that we need a longer budgeting process. In every corporation, every organization, they don't just budget for a quarter, they don't budget for a year, they budget for a longer period. And we don't need to have these fights every single year because if it's a fight during election year, there's no room for compromise. Everyone's trying to score points. So if we extend that process, I think we'll be more successful. Another issue is term limits because we don't get enough young people in the process. I'm not convinced that we should be throwing out those who are successful. I'm not convinced we should be throwing out those who do have experience, but we need more younger, younger people because you need more ideas, you need more discussion and you need more debate. So these are all areas that I would offer. Yes, sir. You uh, showed some data here about why people feel, or not why, but that people feel that this is not working. And here's, by the way, so you can, as he's asking the question, we gave them all these words. We asked them, which ones do you feel about uh, your elected officials? Because we're talking about democracy. The top eight ones are all negative and all the good ones are at the bottom. Go ahead. Um, and your diagnosis is that this is a political issue. What about an economic issue? It's that too. It's be, and it's, it's a political and an economic issue because people don't believe that they're going to get what they deserve. We were taught. There's a different language in the UK than there is in the US. There's a different language in Europe than there is in the UK and a different language in Asia than there is in Europe. If you work hard, you play by the rules, you pay your taxes, you obey the law, you're supposed to live a decent life. And there are now hundreds of millions of people who've done exactly that and their lives suck. And that's part of the problem. Once again, if you make promises to people that you don't keep, Eventually, after a few generations, they get mad at you. And that is exactly what's happening right now when people feel trapped. So is the, is the logical response to that that the economic system has to change, not just the political system? Because the economic system, people's wages in real terms have gone down, not necessarily because of the political system, but because of the economic system. And because we're going to wind up in nine minutes from now, I want to focus on what needs to be changed because everything needs to change. We asked this question about a month ago. Are you re-examining your life? And here's the amazing thing about COVID. So I was here a year ago and it was very difficult. People had to sit apart and masks and all that. We aren't the same people today that we were two and a half years ago. We're not. By that lockdown, now we got too many students here. A whole lot of families got closer together because of lockdown. And a whole lot of marriages blew apart because of lockdown. We actually discovered, I don't really like you. And I don't want to be in the same room with you every single day for the rest of my life. We changed how we think about work. We changed how we think about play. We changed our friends. We prioritized things we never did. Some of us don't want to go back to work anymore. We want to work, but from our homes, not from the office. So the commute has changed. How we interact with each other has changed. Even how we vote has changed. So not only do I endorse what you said about looking at the economy, I think this is a great project for this school, which is a complete rethink about how we live our lives as we go forward from 2022 onward. We're all doing it on an individual basis. Why don't we start looking at our institutions, our economic institutions and our governing institutions? I agree with you. But Frank, can I put to you, a, this is an important <coughs> question from an alumna of the school who's currently running for president in her country. That's why she's not with us. And she says, what would you suggest to a candidate running for president who has to deal with a media that keeps asking only questions which divide society? Opponents don't care about fake news, whether it's fake or not, and using it for campaigning. So what would you advise? I would advise some sort of clean campaign commitment. Mm -hmm. And I got the three C's there. So it's an alliteration so people remember it, which is she refuses. I will not address 
divisions. I will not make the country more divided. That is part of who I am, part of what I'm about. This is what happened in New Zealand. This was, and I know she's not popular now because of, of more recent COVID issues, but the prime minister was loved there and she was not the, the traditional politician. I think there is now room for a commitment not to play it the same way, but you got to be firm about it. You got to put it in writing and you make it part of your campaign. In essence, a clean campaign commitment that changes the way elections will be run uh, for, the, for, for now and in the future. Another question, yes. Uh, I'm wondering if as atonement for your uh, global warming versus climate change frame shift, do you have any ideas for climate when it comes to reframing the issue to make it more salient for people? Yeah, I've been doing it. I briefed, I briefed John Kerry. So I actually went on my own dime to Scott, to uh, Glasgow and spent an hour and a half with his, him and his team to go over language. Number one is you do it correctly. You call it climate change, you're politicizing the issue. You call it climate, you're talking about the issue. Number two, if you talk about sustainability, that's the status quo. What people really want is cleaner, safer, healthier. They want better. I can give you a 25-point advantage if you move to cleaner, safer, healthier world than a sustainable world. Number three, the strongest argument, and it's a new argument, is we will be healthier. People want healthy schools, healthy water, healthy workplace environment healthy communities, that health argument works incredibly well. Number four is you focus on the kids, you focus on the children. What do you want for them in the world that they will inherit? And yes, you can still say it right now. It's not putting it off 20 years. What do we want for our children? Now that works really well in the US, does not really work as well in the UK. What I found out that the UK love animals, Americans love children. <laughs> And I'm actually serious about this. I, you show Bambi or Thumper or a, or a cute little squirrel and that tests really well over here. You show a little baby's hand reaching out to, to cradle the world and that works really well in the States, which is a wonderful illustration that we have to target each culture and each country individually. That there's very little that we can do that's universal. And then the last point is, if we are right, if we're wrong, we are still going to have a better energy policy, a better environmental policy, cleaner air, cleaner water, a safer environment, a healthier environment. And that's if it really doesn't matter. And if it really does matter, we just may save the planet. That's the language to use. Okay, we're going to do two more and then we'll call it quits. But I want to show you this because I believe in this very strongly. We took a look at the people who have actually stopped talking to somebody because they disagreed about politics. It's all coming from you 18 to 29 year olds. If you're 18 to 29 in here, raise your hands. If you're 18 to 29 years old, okay, all of you get out. <laughs> Half of you have stopped talking to someone who's 65 or older here. You're actually, although not in this necessarily in this group, but you're all actually more tolerant. You're less likely to cut someone out. And I've been told the reason why is because you don't have as many people that are alive now. <laughs> so you don't want to write anyone out of your life at this point, because you may drop from three to two. But, um, but this is important. Don't you want to surround yourself with people you disagree with? I know she's going to give me a hard time, but I love calling on her because it's going to be interesting for me. I'm going to learn something from her. You guys got to surround yourself with people you disagree with or surround yourself with people who don't look like you. That's what makes life interesting. And we don't do that enough now. Our ideas about immigration keep people out or ideas about multiculturalism. This is multiculturalism. For those of you who don't like it, look around you. This is success. This is the definition, I would think, of what you would want in society. I love it here because it doesn't look the same. It really does matter. In the very back. Uh, earlier, you spoke about sort of the threat or the potential threat of social media on democracy. 
Um, in your mind, is there a cure, or is, more perhaps more saliently, is there a cure that is not worse than the disease? I, I don't know who I want to administer the cure. And that's the problem. Putting human beings in charge, even if they're making the algorithms, it's the algorithms that cause the problem. You get onto YouTube and each video becomes harsher and uglier and more divisive and more polarizing and darker and whatever. But I, and yet I want the right to do it. I go onto YouTube and I start with videos about the Beatles and it always ends up with John Lennon getting killed. That's, I don't know why, but that's the algorithm that I keep following. And I don't wanna see those videos. I wanna see the music. I don't know how to do it. I know that smarter people than me need to do it. And I know that this would be a great school to have that conversation. Yes. If someone tells you something racist or anti-Semitic or something very off limit, you want to show them this is off limit. So how do you engage with them? How do you not cancel them if they say something you really don't tolerate? Because we're saying we're, the same, we're saying we're diversity here, but I, I think we're actually very similar. I think, I don't think anyone here is like, you know, racist and xenophobic, when I say something that's completely off limit. Well, that's, that's the issue here. Like, you, you need to cancel some people if you think they're saying something off limit. So I understand you want to talk to them, but how do you also show them this is not okay? I don't argue with people who hate me. I don't waste any time with people who hate me. There's so much to get done and so little time in life and we are so blessed to be here that I wanna work on those who are neutral to try to bring them around. And those who like me, I'm gonna to try to get them to love me. But uh, my answer is if you hate, I have no time for you. It's not really canceling, it's just, it's ignoring. One more, and he's gotta be, I, I'm gonna, okay, so I've gone to you already. Now, this is the last question. I really wanna be invited back here year after year. So you got to give me a question that's like right over the plate. I do love baseball. I don't know cricket that I can answer really, really well. If you don't want to talk to people that hate you, now how do you expect people to talk to people with different opinions? Because usually when we don't want to talk to people is because we think that they hate us or we think that they hold very extreme opinions. So we don't want to argue with them. So I think that's a quite contradictory to what you're saying. It's your first solution to get people to discuss and to talk to people. Actually, the first way to do that is to teach people not to hate when they're younger mm -hmm. so that we don't have to deal with the issue, that you don't teach division in for younger kids. I spent three days at Radley and it was the most amazing experience for me. There was no cancel culture. There was no uh, populism. There was no wokeism. These kids want to learn and they want to ask questions and they want to understand and they're engaging with each other and they're helping each other and they're supporting each other and they're 13 14 15 years old the way that you address hatred among people in their 20s and 30s is not to let it start when they're 10 or 15 years old and that's why nothing is more important than education of all the issues and all the fixes i can give you about democracy and civility, and decency, and being open-minded. This institution is part of that. Education is part of that. And we simply make a commitment to learn more. We make a commitment to surround ourselves with people that we may not understand, and therefore we may be nervous about, but we have to do it at the youngest possible age. And if our education system is falling short, which almost everyone is right now with, with how much the world is changing, then we need to tackle that more than anything else. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful for your questions and your comments. I'm so grateful for this discussion. I'm grateful for Levotnik, and I'm particularly grateful to, with the, for the person in charge. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you.